morning, everybody. Welcome to Hessel Church. Let's go ahead and let's stand with one another this morning as we get ready to exalt our Savior, sing to Him. I want to start our morning with some scripture from Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. For the Lord is great and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he has made it, and his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship, let us bow down, let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let's come and let's worship him together. Just putting all the rings, our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fist, our God is an awesome God. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God, he reigns. From heaven above with wisdom and power and love, our God is an awesome God. When the sky was starless in the void of the night, our God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and created the light, our God is an awesome God. Judgment and wrath he poured out of Sodom. Mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom and power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. From heaven above in wisdom and power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom and power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom and power. And Is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom and power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. You may all have a seat. I just got a couple quick announcements for you. Uh, first off, if you're new here, we just want to say welcome and thank you you're here. Uh, if you want to stop by the Welcome Center in the back, we have a small gift for you just to, just to say thank you and welcome. Um, first, we got uh, Women's Paint Night coming up. It's uh, April 26th, 6.30. Uh, it's out on the patio, and uh, we'll, ladies will be guided through their own art. There's going to be snacks and fellowships. It's going to be a blast for all you ladies. Um, next is the Boomer's Barbecue. That is April 19th from 6 to 8.15, also on the patio. Um, there's going to be tri-tip, chicken, campfire songs, trivia, fellowship. Sounds like a lot of fun. I wish I was a Boomer because I would go to that. Uh, cost is $10. There's more information on that on the Church Center app. Sign up. Uh, it's going to be a blast. And then next we have Adventure Camp coming up. This is July 15th through the 19th. It's 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., so if you're thinking about volunteering but you're worried that you have to serve all day, that's not the case. It's 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and it's so important that we have volunteers because for every one volunteer, five more kids can show up, and it's just so important that we can have as many kids show up as we can because we want to share the gospel with them. Um, 
we have a picture up from last year's Adventure Camp. Just all the smiles. It's a blast. Um, if you want to sign up, sign up. We need volunteers. We want more kids. More information on that is also on the Church Center app. Everything I talked to talked about today is also on the church center app that's all i've got it's nice and simple if you would uh continue to stand in our time of worship
themselves that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But He came and He died and He rose. Those walls are up. Giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. Those giants This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray. We heard Whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of His faithfulness Never once did He fail And He never will This is our God This is who He is he loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did. He did. Who paid for all of our sins? Nobody but Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did. He did. Who paid for all of our sins? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh. Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God. King Jesus, for the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. So thankful, so thankful that you sent your son to come down and die for the sin that we cannot, we cannot pay for ourselves, and that he defeated the grave, he defeated death. Father, thank you so much for that love, the love that we don't deserve in the least. But you loved us, you had mercy on us. Father, I pray that we never forget your almighty love and that you use us as we leave this place today as tools in your gospel message. Father, we wanna be lights in our community for you and let everyone know what you've done. We love you. We pray this in your wonderful name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Before I get into my message, I wanted to just do a, a 
talk about a couple things. First one is, uh, again, if you live in Santa Rosa uh, and would be willing to check out our other campus, uh, next week is a Sunday that uh, we're having kind of a vision casting thing, uh, and so the service is at 1045, and if you would like to be a part of a lunch afterwards where they talk about the vision of the campus, um, get online and tell us that you're coming. Uh, we love it here. We love being together. We love the fellowship. Uh, some of you like the pastor. I, I've heard. Uh, but if you want to be a part of something that God is doing, we weren't looking for this. God kind of dropped this ministry in our laps, and we're having some issues today. Have you figured that out? It's not you. Uh, it, we just, uh, maybe God's going to tap you on the shoulder and just ask you to be a part of something over at this other campus. Uh, next Sunday is a great Sunday to hear from Pastor Israel. Go to church there and then hang out for lunch afterwards with other people and hear the vision uh, that we are uh, sharing on that campus. And so that's great. Then secondly, uh, many of you have been following along with our news that in the last 24 hours, uh, Iran began to fire hundreds of missiles and uh, drones uh, against Israel. And uh, by God's grace and mercy, um, no one has been really fatally hurt. Uh, one 10-year-old girl was wounded, and she's going to recover. But uh, when you think of how many attacks and different missiles and uh, were going on, it's just a lot. And I, I just want to, as a church, remind us that we should be praying for Israel. The Bible is very specific that the nation of Israel is God's special people that he chose. Uh, it also says in, in Genesis chapter 12 that those that curse Israel will be cursed. Those that, that bless Israel would be blessed. And uh, we have brothers and sisters in the Lord who are living there as well. Matter of fact, uh, Jews for Jesus is a group that we have, are partnered with. And uh, they, I got several reports from them in the last 24 hours of talking about people running toward bunkers and trying to, kids being traumatized and different things like that, but the gospels continue to go out and they're asking for prayer. And uh, matter of fact, David Brickner with Jews for Jesus will be here for this, but uh, we want to just stop this morning and pray for uh, this nation that is surrounded by enemies on every side. Um, people have talked about the complexity of the Middle East and it's really simple and you can kind of get a feel for this. Um, if, if all the nations around Israel that hate Israel were to say, um, and this is not being political, if they were to say, hey, we want peace, and we're going to prove that we want peace, we're going to burn up all of our weapons, uh, and we're gonna, we want peace. You know what would happen the next day? Peace. If you had Israel lay down their, all their weapons and say, we want peace, and we're going to burn all our weapons, you know what you'd have? Annihilation. And it's as simple as that. And we as a church, we just want to be found faithful and praying for this nation, that are God's people, and uh, we do want to pray for peace. We, we pray for that. So just, will you bow your head with me? Father, right now, we just want to pause and recognize that nothing that has happened in the last 24 hours is a surprise to you. You're a sovereign God. You are in control of all things. We thank you and praise you that, that though there are so many different opportunities for people to be seriously ki wounded and even killed, that God, you protected. And Lord, I just want to pray that you would um, bless and protect this nation. And uh, Lord, we, we want to pray for the children and parents of little kids who are being traumatized as well. And God, we just want to pray for peace, peace in Jerusalem, but peace throughout all of Israel and peace throughout the region on all sides. And so, Lord, we just, uh, again, we thank you that we can trust you with this. Um, we, we also know that we need to be reminded that to put our trust in you during uncertain times like these, we, we don't, we, we've read the rest of the book. We, we know how the story ends. The Bible says in prophecies that one day there will be a massive uh, uh, cataclysmic event, war that is going to happen in this part of the world. And then you're going to return. And so God, we don't know when that's going to be. You do. And we can rest in the fact that even now that you're in complete control. 
Lord, we want to pray for groups like Jews for Jesus and other Christian groups that are ministering to the both physical and spiritual needs, emotional needs, uh, psychological needs of people in this region. And we want to pray again for peace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A few months ago, uh, I was laying out sermon series for the rest of the year, and I started to just feel led to spend time in the first chapter of Colossians. One of the reasons why I believe I'm, I'm led here is that um, we live in a day and age when there is um, a lot of different groups, religions, and belief systems who don't, do not deny Jesus. Matter of fact, they, they believe Jesus is real. But they take who Jesus is, according to the scripture, and they twist it. Um, just ever so slightly. And so they're not saying don't believe in Jesus. They'll just twist who Jesus is. Um, if this, uh, last week I talked about it as well, but Islam is one of the fastest growing religions in the world. They don't deny the existence of Jesus. They say that Jesus is one of the five prophets. That, that Noah, Noah was a prophet, Abraham is a prophet, uh, Moses is a prophet, Jesus is the prophet, and the greatest prophet is Muhammad. So they don't tell you not to believe in Jesus. Oh, Jesus is a prophet. But they do not give Jesus the priority preeminence that he deserves. We see this with uh, uh, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. Again, they don't deny Jesus. They say, yeah, Jesus is there. But they believe the Jesus that is there is a created being who became God. And by the way, you can become a God too one day. And so they, we all talk about Jesus. And so what's confusing here is that, that these different groups will, will use similar terminology and vocabulary, and it makes us feel like we're all on the same page, and they're talking about a totally different Jesus. And so I, in, my, in my sermon time of preparing for this, I start thinking about this one case in particular where a lady who had been attending our church years and years ago, even before I was a pastor here, she was a member she moved away from the area, and so to be a member, you buy into, you sign your life to the doctrinal statement, you say, yep, that's what I believe, I'm all on board. So she made a, a, a profession of belief. She went away for several years, she came back, and she came to me, and she said, hey, um, I, I'm back visiting, I live in another area. I said, well, what church are you going to? And she said, the Church of Jesus of Latter-day Saints. Well, Jesus' name is even in the title right there, right? So it's got to be okay. And I'm thinking, that is not the same Jesus. And so what we have in our country, in our churches, especially in America, there is a, a scarcity of solid biblical doctrine. And so what it has produced is churches that are basically filled with biblically illiterate people when it comes to the, to the person and the work of who Jesus is and what he did. And I was so burdened by this, I thought, you know, I need to just spend some time on this very topic of who Jesus is. So for the next seven weeks, we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 13 through verse 23, 11 verses if you're counting, seven weeks and 11 verses. Today we're going to get through one. So we're going we're gonna to dig in, and I want, before I, I get going too far, I just want to read what Warren Wearsby, who is a commentary, co commentator, a biblical commentator, uh, has written, brilliant man, godly man, he said this, we're going to be in Colossians, Colossians 1, 13 through 23, and let me just, before I read this, the backdrop is this, the church was started on the glorious gospel of Jesus, everybody gets saved. Over a period of time, false teachers start to come into the church. Paul sends this young pastor, Epaphras, to go check out the church. He gets there and he finds all this false teaching. What they've done is they've taken the person and work of Jesus and they slightly start twisting it to be a different Jesus. Epaphras doesn't really know what to do. So he goes to Rome who's, to see Paul who's in prison. He, he says, Paul... What do I do with this? And so Paul sets down, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he begins to write this letter. It's a treatise of who is Jesus, the person and the work of Jesus, to the church at Colossae. 
Warren Wiersbe says this, the false teachers in Colossae, like the false teachers of our own day, would not deny the importance of Jesus Christ. They would simply dethrone him. They'll make him a prophet, right? Dethrone him, giving him prominence, but not preeminence. This is confusing because we're talking about Jesus, but they're starting to twist the person of Jesus. Now, you got to remember, and it's very important, when Satan comes, he does not come in a red suit and a pitchfork. The Bible says, see if you know this, he comes as an angel of what? Light. He looks like the real deal. He, he doesn't look like the angel of death or the angel of darkness. He looks like the angel of light. He looks like the real deal. So that's what, how these false teachers get in and they start twisting who Jesus is. And so in order for us to identify, know who, how, what, what they've twisted, we got to know the real deal. So as I was reading, getting ready for this, I, you may not know this, but every time I preach a series, I start reading through, and every week I'll read through a passage, um, sometimes 50 times or more times. I just want to be saturated in what it says. Let my heart be saturated. And so as I was reading, I sometimes read different translations. I was reading in the New American Standard Version, and I read down to this passage and the heading of this passage was the incomparable Christ incomparable do you say incomparable or you say incomparable I mean I what, what what's the right way you can go either way just in case you're wondering well what does it mean I don't usually use the word incomparable in my daily life what does incomparable mean so I pulled out some dictionaries and I started looking up when I don't know what the word means I need to look it up so here's some different ones Webster says that incomparable, incomparable, is standing out beyond comparison. Um, the, uh, I'm going to find it here in my, my notes here. The Macmillan Dictionary says, so good that nothing else can compare. The American Heritage Dictionary says, being such that comparison is impossible. And the Collins Dictionary says, beyond or above comparison, matchless, unequaled. And so if we were to, 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 to substitute incomparable with these words, we'd be left with something like the, the beyond comparison Christ. What we're studying is the matchless and unequaled Christ, the one whose comparison is impossible. Here's my conclusion. There is nobody else like Jesus. Amen? Amen? There is nobody else like Jesus. So we begin this series called The, In the Incomparable Christ, and I want to really invite, encourage you to invite your friends. This is, this is basic stuff. Who is this Jesus that we're asking people to follow? Who, who is he? And, and invite them to come and journey with you. Now, before I jump into the text, I want to read you what John MacArthur said about Colossians 1 that we're going to be studying over the next seven weeks. John MacArthur, a pastor, Bible scholar, he says this, the Bible is supremely the book about the Lord Jesus Christ, but of all the Bible's teachings about Jesus Christ, none is more significant than Colossians 1. This dramatic and powerful passage removes any needless doubt or confusion over Jesus' true identity. It is vital to a proper understanding of the Christian faith. So, with that understanding, let's open up our Bibles to Colossians 1 and let's jump in. We're going to jump in at verse 13, for just one verse today. Here's where, where we'll read. Verse 13 says this. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, if you want to look at the rest of this passage, verses 12, uh, 13 through 23, every time he and him and his is mentioned, it's always talking about Jesus. But in verse 13, he's not talking about Jesus. When it says he and his, he's not talking about Jesus. You say, well, who is he speaking about? Great question. We have to look up at verse 12 to figure that out. Verse 12 says this, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. What's that mean? It is the Father who delivers us. 
Stay with me here. He, and so the verses 13 through 23, we are going to learn what the Father has accomplished through the person and work of Jesus Christ in saving us. How the Father has qualified us. See that word, qualified us? You know you're qualified? That word in the Greek means to make worthy, to make suitable or acceptable. The Father, through Christ, has made you worthy, suitable, and acceptable. So years ago, when I was at Biola University, uh, Lori and I had these a couple friends that we met. It was Bucky and Kathy Dennis. And so let me tell you a little bit about Bucky. Uh, Bucky had a really tough upbringing. His dad was filthy, 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 filthy rich. His dad owned several huge, well-known restaurants in Southern California, up on ridges overlooking the, the coast, up in the hills, all these different high-end restaurants. And he was making a boatload of money. And Bucky was the heir apparent. He was going to be the guy that was going to take his father's place and make a boatload of money. So all was going well. Bucky's going well. You know, just so you know, Bucky did not take a school bus to, to school. He was chauffeured in a limousine by a chauffeur. That's how he went to school as a kid. And the poor guy, when he turned 16 years old, his dad bought him a brand new Porsche. A Porsche. Are you paying attention to me? With the license plate Bucky D on the back of it. Well, Bucky's going on through life. He's a good kid. He's a great student. And he goes to, an after, to a, a, a club, a Bible club at his school, Southern California. And he learns about Jesus. He, also in this going with him is his girlfriend, who later became his wife, Kathy. And they hear of Jesus for the first time in their lives. They're sophomores in high school, and they get lit up for Jesus. They find out that he loved them that he died on the cross for them, that he rose again, and he was worthy of them giving their lives to. And they were all in. They began to, they had this insatiable appetite to learn and to grow more of Jesus, more of Jesus. They went home. Nobody in their families were Christians, none of them. And they just started sharing Jesus, telling them about what Jesus had done for them. And in time, the whole family starts getting saved. Everybody starts, who is this Jesus guy? And they're telling them, they, they just are excited about it. So Bucky, at the end of high school, he plays basketball all the way through. He's a great athlete. He comes to Biola, the school I'm going to. He joins the team. I'm already on. He's a couple years younger than me. And he joins our team. And we become really good friends. And uh, he and his wife, Kathy, and, and Lori and I became, uh, we hang out together and everything like that. After I graduated, he's still in school and whatnot. And we used to hang out with Bucky and Kathy. And uh, just so you know, we lived in different worlds. Lori and I had no money at all. We were flat broke. I mean, we would save up literally three months so that we could go down and get a burger together. Both of us get a burger and we split a fry for $7.50. $7.50. So this was crazy. So Bucky and Kathy, they're like, oh, come out with us. We'll go to these really fancy restaurants. And they would pay. I'd never eaten so good in my life. It was awesome. And, and they, they go, you know, it's okay. We're writing it off. I go, how do you write this thing off? They go, we're spying. I go, spying? He goes, yeah, yeah. My dad's got this business, you know, stuff going to his restaurants. We want to see what the, other, what the com competitors are doing. So you're on us. I go, I love being a spy. This is awesome. So we have all this fun together. We hang out with, it's not, if you don't have a rich friend, it's just nice to have one. I just, it's awesome, right? So, so we... So one day they go, hey, come on out to our place. And we said, oh, okay, yeah, we'll go out there. So I've told you about this before. I had this beautiful yellow Pinto, Ford Pinto, 1977 vintage model. So I get in this car. So we go out and we find, this is before GPS. We're driving, okay, we're following this, you know, map or whatever. And we, we get out to this place. Now, we, we start circling around and this is like this mansion. And around this mansion is this high wall. I mean, everything about this wall was clear. Keep out. You are not wanted in here. So we find, well, worked ourselves around. We finally got to this place. There was a little place to turn in. We turn in, and the wall stops, but there's a gate. It's big, too. Keep out, right? So I pull up to it. I look around. All of a sudden, off to the side, there's a little guard shack. And this guy steps out. This guy's clipboard. He's all dressed like, you know, a security guy, I guess. He steps out and he goes, what do you want? And I'm like, uh, 
we're here to see Bucky and Kathy. And they, he says, what's your names? And they said, uh, <laughs> we're looking good in my pinto, right? Rich and Lori Cundall. And uh, he says, hold on a second. He looks at his clipboard. Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Cundall, the dentists are expecting you. <laughs> the gate, like this. My pinto, you know, in through the car. Everything about that place said, keep out. But I was qualified to go in because I knew somebody on the inside. See, what qualifies us to be in relationship with we know who's on the inside is Jesus. He's the one who qualifies us. So this morning, as we begin our study, I want us to look at two wonderful truths about the person of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. The first truth is this. Through the incomparable Christ, we have experienced the mercy of God. Did you hear that? It's on the screen. He has delivered us. That word from the domain of darkness, that word uh, delivered means to rescue or to drag away from imminent danger. It's the picture of, and we've seen it in movies all the time, right? The car flips over and it's rolling down and gasoline's spilling out and somebody goes over to the person, they're saying, hey, come on, get out. And the person's unconscious and the person reaches down and grabs that person and literally drags them from danger to safety and through no efforts of that person. That person is out cold, but is drug over here and is rescued. That's the picture of what Christ has done for you and me. Now listen, you said, well, I wasn't in danger. How could I be in domain of darkness? How could I be in imminent danger? It says we are in the domain of darkness. Now, at the same time that Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, he's also writing to the church at Ephesus. Both of these two churches had false teachers creep in, and they had similar issues. Matter of fact, he writes them about the same time. They're parallel books. A lot of people think that the Colossians, which only has four chapters, is the short version, and it's more expanded in the six chapters of Ephesians. But they're they're dealing with the same thing. Listen to what Ephesians 2, 1 says. And you were... Dead in the trespasses and sin. What he's doing is he's describing what it looks like when you and I were walking in the domain of darkness. The first reality is that you are dead in your sins. What's that mean? Listen, listen. Every single person since Adam and Eve has been born dead to God and alive to sin. That's why nobody has to teach us to be bad when we're little. It comes natural, right? You have to teach us to be good. We have no appetite for God. We have no desire to seek after God until and unless he draws us to himself. Look at verse 2. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom... We all once lived in the passions of our own flesh, of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. So, because I'm dead to God, I live a life that's dominated by sin. I live a life uh, where I seek to desire my, uh, to satisfy the desires and pleasures of my own flesh. I don't seek to, to follow the pleasures of God. I, I'm living my life of sin. I'm driven by my desires, not God's. Then look what he says. And we're, because of this, listen, listen, don't miss it. And we're, by nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Not only am I dead in my sin, listen, not only am I unable to stop sinning and obey God, you and I have no hope of ever being rescued by ourselves, ever escaping God's wrath. Listen to me and never forget this. 
God is holy. And he cannot and he will not be in relationship with sin. And because of that, we who are in, before Christ, we are in our sin, are children of wrath. That is what we deserve. Our lives are dominated by sin. That, in, in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, you've seen this before. The wages of sin is death. And he's not just talking physical death. He's talking spiritual death. It's what you and I earn because we're children of wrath. It's what we earn because we've all been born into this sinful world. We are sinners ourselves. The Bible says this. If you and I got what we really deserved, if you and I got what we really deserved, we would spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. And if that rubs you the wrong way, you have too high of a view of yourself. If I got what I deserve, me, Rich Kundal, I would spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. So let's just go recap. I want to read through Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, and then we're going to go on. But just, I want you to get the flow. Look at it again. And you were dead in, your, in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of in the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Look what follows in verse 4. But God. That's a great place to say amen. But God being rich in what? Mercy. Thank God that he is rich in mercy. That means an overabundant, overflowing, oozing out of God's character is mercy. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. He loves you. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. The Bible says that on the cross, Jesus took all of the wrath that children of wrath deserve. We were children of wrath. He dumped it all on Jesus. Jesus took it all. He paid the price. He endured the wrath of God. He died. He didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead as a testimony of the fact that the Father God had accepted his sacrifice on the cross and payment for the wrath that you and I deserved. And God did that because of you love, he loves you and because he loves me. He did for you and me what we could not do for ourselves. And now... If you've trusted Jesus Christ, I want you to understand, you are no longer a child of wrath, praise God. You're a child of the king. That's mercy. So here's, here's the second truth. Through the incomparable Christ, we now enjoy the grace of God. Now let me tell you something. Mercy's great. It's great. But if you have no grace, you only got half the story. Mercy, again, is God not giving me what I deserve. I deserve the wrath, his wrath. He gives me grace. Let's take a look at definition of grace. It says this. Grace is God giving me what I do not deserve, the good stuff. Mercy is God not giving me the bad stuff that I deserve. Grace is God giving me the good stuff that I don't deserve. That's why Paul writes in verse 13. He says, he's delivered us from the domain of darkness and, okay, that's the mercy, that's the mercy, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Do you know what the problem is with most Christians today? One of the problems is that we don't believe what the Bible says. We, we don't understand that he's transferred us to the kingdom. We're children, we're daughters and sons of the king. We're kind of like the prodigal son who goes off, squanders his life, lives 
fleshly life. And then he has this epiphany in the pig pen. That's a great title for a sermon. The epiphany in the pig pen. He has this epiphany. He goes, this is not working out for me well. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go home. And I know that the father, he's full of mercy. He'll forgive me. And he'll just make me a household slave. He got the mercy part. But what happens when he goes home? The father says, oh, no, 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 no. Put a robe on him. He's my son. He doesn't deserve it. But I give to him that which he, which he does not deserve. I love this. Do you know that every day you and I get up and we're given God's grace, stuff that we don't deserve? Yes, forgiveness. Yes, purpose. But one of the greatest things of grace is he says, I want you to come in. You're my kid, man. You're my daughter. You're my son. Just come into my presence. I'm the king. I'm the creator of the world. I created everything. And I'm going I'm to ask you to come into my, my throne room with all your problems. Just bring them to me because I don't want you to carry them. You weren't made to carry them. I'm made to carry them. Just come on in. Cast your care down before me. I care about you. I love you. Grace. There, there's two aspects that grace speaks to. The first thing is that grace speaks to my position in the kingdom. The word transferred, which I have underlined there, is really in the Greek two words put together. One is to change and the other one is to place or to stand. And when you put these two words together, it's a compound word. When you put them together, it means to change my standing. Let's just read it that way. I'm going to put it on the screen. And he changed our standing to the kingdom of his beloved son. You may not realize this, but before Christ, you and I were not just hanging out there. God was indifferent to us. We were on the opposing team. We were enemies with God. We were at war with God. But through Christ and the grace of God, he changed our standing for eternity. And I love this. He says he transferred us. It's past tense, right? Let me give you another uh, passage in Ephesians 2, 6. He's talking about the same thing. It says this. And he, he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's what he did. You're stand, let me, how, many, how many English majors we have here? Okay, you guys, we don't have any. I'm sorry. So those of you that went through sixth grade English at some point, let me ask you a question. The two words that are underlined, raised and seated, are those present tense or past tense? It's not a trick question. It is a past tense, right? He says, it is done. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, listen to me, this is the coolest thing ever. You are seated. It is so done that God looks at you, not as this guy trying to measure up, this woman is trying to keep up and measure up to God's standard. He, because of what Christ has done in your life, because of grace in your life, God sees you as seated with Christ in the heavenly places right now. That's how done it is. It's remarkable. You know, sometimes if we could just get this, if we could get the mercy part of God that we were children of God and we've been transferred to become children of the King, if we could understand that we are under His grace, I just wonder what it would really do to our worship experience. I wonder what it would really do when we just come to church and we kind of yawn our, our way through the day and we do, would that cha change it? Verse 7 goes on of Ephesians 2. It says this. Again, you, what he's saying is, listen, Christ did all the work. You don't have to perform. Christ did the work. Christ did the performing. You're seated now by faith in Christ. You're seated now with him in the heavenlies. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know what this means? Listen. 
that from the moment of salvation onward, I am a trophy of God's grace. I don't look like it, but I'm a trophy of what Christ has done in and through my life. Because I know somebody on the inside. And he's made me a trophy of his grace from now to through eternity. The second thing that, that, that grace speaks to, it speaks to my mission in the kingdom. I'm going to tell you your future here in a moment. So get ready. You want to know what the future holds? I'm going to tell you. I, I went online this morning. And just out of curiosity, I went onto a website. If somebody's checking out my browsing history, you're going to find some weird stuff. It says, how much does a palm reader, the average palm reader, cost in Las Vegas? If you want your future told, it's $275. It goes higher, but that's the average. So I'm doing you a favor. This is free, okay? <laughs> Not going to try. One day. If you know Jesus, if you've been a recipient of his mercy and of his grace, the Bible tells us what's going to happen in Revelation. When we're all together with the Lord around the throne one day in glory, and in Revelation chapter 5, verse, verse 9, it says this, and they sang. Now, that's going to be new for some of you because I watch you during worship and you don't sing. But one day, and they sang a new song, saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, he's speaking of Jesus there, you were slain. And by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a what? A kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Through Christ, listen, the Father is building a kingdom from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And one day, we're going to gather around the throne and we're going to celebrate that we have received mercy and we've received grace because of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be celebrating. But here's your mission now. To open your mouths and to tell other people about the mercy and grace. that you've received through the person and the work of Jesus. That's it. That's your mission. That's why Matthew chapter 24, verse 14 says, and the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And get this last line. And then the, what's it say? And will come. We don't know when that's going to be. The Father alone knows when that date's going to take place, but I'm going to tell you this, there's going to be a point in time when that one last soul, man or woman, child, we don't know, is going to place his or her faith in Jesus Christ. And when that happens, this world as we know it is going to end. Christ is going to come back with a shout. And I'm going to tell you something. Whatever you have on your calendar the next day is not going to matter. What we're talking about here that you first and foremost have experienced God's mercy and his grace and that you share it with others is what this life is all about. Everything that you and I have our work, our energy, our money is really all a platform for us to declare that God is merciful through Jesus Christ and he's gracious through Jesus Christ. So let me ask you two questions. 
Have you ever received God's mercy and grace? Have you ever trusted him as Lord and Savior? Have you been transferred from the kingdom, from the, being a, a child of wrath to being a child of the king? It's simple. The Bible says it's simple because all the hard stuff Jesus did, he died on the cross for you. You can just, where you are, say, I believe Jesus, you're God. You died on the cross for me. I sinned and rose again. I trust you. That's it. That's it. It's not complex. This is the grace and mercy of God we're talking about here. Here's the second question. When was the last time that you opened your mouth? When you shared with somebody else about the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, about the person and work of Jesus and how he died for you. Ah, Rich, I've done it before. Nobody listens. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to open your mouth. So Bucky, my friend from college, (laughs) remarkable story because as his family all started getting saved, uh, I got to meet them in time. Matter of fact, Bucky and I went to Australia. We played basketball all over Australia and New Zealand one summer together on a ministry team. And, and Bucky's dad, Bucky Sr., came with us. And I used to watch the father and the son. And they have a really close relationship. And I, 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 they, they did this unique thing I'd never seen a father and son do before, but... They'd have their arms around each other and their heads would be touching and they'd be talking so only the two of them could hear. And Bucky Cena used to tell me, I don't know where I'd be if Bucky, my son, had not told me about Jesus. I don't know where I'd be. We're, we're close, but because of Christ, we're so close, much closer. You know somebody on the inside. You need to share with your friends the person you know on the inside who is the only way, the only truth, the only life. It's Jesus. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this morning. It's been so good to just start with one single verse (laughs) and to see how your mercy and grace is offered and received by all believers. I even think of my friend Bucky, who after going all the way through in business school and getting his MBA, several years into the business, you called him into the ministry, and he's a pastor of a large church out in Southern California this day because mercy and grace changes us. And we praise you for that. And we also praise you for the opportunity that we have. You've put people into my life that you put, have not put into anybody else in this room's life. And likewise, you put people into the people in this room's life that are not in my life and in nobody else's life. Lord, may we be a people who open our mouths and share confidently about the saving grace and mercy of, of Christ. And Lord, we, we again, just as we will be in the next seven weeks in this passage, God, that you would grow our understanding of who the person and work of Jesus, the significance of the person and work of Jesus. Give it, keep us close to the truth. There's a lot of people who are twisting out there. They make it sound the same, but it's not the same Jesus. Lord, the truth of who you are, Jesus, is in the word, and may we stay close to it. Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. You please stand.
the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave at the sound.
to rescue me, oh, the wonder of it all. If you would leave the ninety-nine, and I'm the one you came to find. beyond your reach on the cross you reached for me oh the wonder of it all oh the wonder of it all on a sinner's cross you died for me Till day three, when you arose in victory, and you have shattered sin's decree. The death of death, the death of death is life for me. The death of death is life for me. that the wonder of it all would be your focus this week, that, 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 that God's mercy and grace would just be, you would be overwhelmed with. That would cause you to realize that if you could trust him with your salvation, you can trust him with your problems. You can tr- trust him with the challenges that are going on right now in your life. Just being overwhelmed, but the wonder of it all would cause you to say, you know what? When somebody is in front of me and God is moving me, I'd open my mouth and I'd share. I would pray that you just have a week of being overwhelmed by the wonder of it all. His mercy and his grace that he's given to you. I also hope that you'll hang around for a little bit, enjoy some great fellowship out on the patio. It is great to be together with you today. It must be time to be done because Kennedy says it's over right now. <laughs> Uncle Rich loves you, Kennedy. It's okay. God bless you. Have a great week. Love you guys. Have a great one.